Yeah. Yes. Uh, thank you, Terry. And thank you all for coming to hear my story. When I told the story to the people at the, uh, the college down there across the KIC building, I didn't realize that I was going to go deeper into the college. And, but uh, it is okay. But, uh, I, I told the story because I, I had a lot, a lot of students who were looking at me, and all these little faces were looking so anticipated. I was carried away, <laughs> and, and, and uh, I enjoyed it, and I can speak very well in Somalia. I, when I first started with Terry, I told her that I can speak uh, Somalia in a conversational style, but uh, at that time I didn't realize that I had a a much larger and broader background in Somalia. And through the years that we spent with Terry and teaching Somalia, uh, I found, I began to see that uh, I knew a lot more than just conversational. <laughs> but the, the only real thing that I fall short on is the count. I can't count any more than five. You know, Terry counts up to ten or twenty. I forget. But uh, the the sounds that she uses, I never heard before. <laughs> you know. But uh, but it's okay. I don't know who wrote them, but they came out of a a book, I think. And. Uh, I, I I asked a couple of elder people to teach me how to count in Somalia when I was about four years old. And they told me, they said, John, you'll be going to school next year and you will learn to count the Western style. So I don't see why you would have to spend days learning how to count in Somalia because there are several ways to count. You count for the animals, the people, the boats. And there are several ways to count in Somalia. But it, uh, they, they, they didn't want to teach me that because by next year they said I would be learning how to count in English. And I did. But uh, the ironical part of it was I learned to count before I went to grade school because I had an older brother that's four years older than I was and his name was Wilbur. And he went to grade government school way before I even stepped into the door. And he, he showed me how to count and he showed me how to to do what was called the time tables. I don't know if you're acquainted with that or not, but it's a multiplication, addition, subtraction, division, and percentage. There's five ways that he taught me. <coughs> and then I, this is what I use most of my life, what, what, what my dear brother taught me. And, and that's not the story of the first hemlock tree. And I thought I'd throw that in. <laughs> and uh, I hear her mention something about the depression that happened in my childhood days. And my dad, for some reason or another, decided to teach me uh, how to subsist is what they call it now. But uh, my dad said that it's a way of life, is what it's sometimes called it. Double the devotion is the word for subsistence. And uh, that's what he taught me. He taught me where to dig for clams, dig for cockles, and get uh, seaweed, how to get uh, 
deers and where to go to catch halibut and bottom fish. And when the depression hit, uh, I was such a good guy providing uh, food for the, my mom to take care of, to use. I, she never ran short of food. I had all kinds of fish for her. I had all kinds of seaweed for her. I had all the native food that I can get off the rocks for her. And uh, what is Yance? One of them, the word is called Yance in Somalia. I think, uh, uh, what do they call gumboots? Yance. No, in English. Gumboots. Gumboots. <laughs> <laughs> okay, gumboots. <laughs> and there, uh, I ran across a whole bunch of them in Nicholas Rock. That's just a channel way down that way, just on the north west side of an island. And I picked all these gumboots off the rocks and put them in a bucket, and then I, I laid them outside the door on the porch of our house, and I told my mom about it. I said, you can cook them tomorrow or tonight or wherever you want, <laughs> but they're just outside the door. There's a bucket full of them, I told her. And and it was late at night, so I went to bed. And the next morning, she woke me up, and she said, John, John. He said, I thought you said there was a bucket full of gumboots outside the door. I said, yes, sit there. I, I picked them. And I laid it there outside the door. And and he went out there and looked for it. Sure enough, the bucket was empty. And as I turned around, I saw all these black spots on the door. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And the walls of the, on, on the uh, porch, uh, that porch, the walls on the porch are all full of gumboots. <laughs> I never knew they could travel that fast. <laughs> and I never seen them travel either. They're always on the rocks underneath uh, uh, seaweeds and other growth on the rocks, you know. So, so during the Depression, I supplied all the food. Um, my dad was working in the New England Coast storage, so I used his skip to get all this food. And when I heard the uh, people were talking about how short of food they were downtown when I was walking around, I wondered why the channel was full of herring and uh, and you could see the ducks all eating the herring. And, and the fishes were jumping all over the place, They're feeding on the herring. And the whales and the sea lions were coming, and the seals were coming up the creek after the, after the herrings. And all of this food out there, and they were running short of food. Because, of course, they didn't have a father like I did. He showed me how to subsist, Simpson style. And I was glad they did. He showed me all this. Because it got me to where I am today. And when I was talking to Dr. Malachar, I don't know if you are acquainted with her or not, but she was my doctor. And I... And, and she told me that I was one of the very fortunate few, she said, that lived during when the, what, there was no pollution in the forest and in the water. Now you could gather any food you wanted to eat and you, you won't have to worry about pollution. And, and that's the way it was. That's how I grew up, and that's why she said, I'm still living yet. <laughs> she said, uh, you're eating all the good food that nature can provide. And uh, 
but uh, this is a, just a side thing from the story of the hemlock tree. Did you know that the hemlock tree is, is uh, the hardwood that we have in our forest? You know, I, I was uh, building a, help building a house in Metalcatla one day, and uh, I drove the nails through the ship laps, and, uh, and I just got into the, through the ship laps, and into the frame of the building. And I didn't know these, these people were using hemlocks for framework. And when the nail hit the hemlock, the dry hemlocks, it becomes just like, uh, uh, what was that uh, wood I told you about? Uh, iron bark. Iron bark, yes. And it's just like iron bark. And you can't drive the nail into the wood unless you drill a hole first and then you drive the nail in. But, uh, but that's, uh, that's a hardwood from our forest. When you cure it and dry it, it'll become a, a hardwood. And it's the toughest wood I know in our forest. Now I will tell you how that hemlock tree started. And the, the word for hemlock in Somalia is deeg. Uh, deeg is hemlock. And, and, uh, and this uh, story started years ago. Way to go off is the word I will use. Way to go off. Now, one get it out. Kaldo. So we just added a Kaldop. That's a town or a village. And, uh, and they lived there, the Simpsons lived there. And in this Kaldo uh, or village. And, uh, and there was a the Simpson didn't like the idea of anybody practicing a, a what was that word now? Halai. Halai, yeah. This is my dictionary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Halai. Yeah. The Simpson didn't like anybody that would practice halai as witchcraft in English. And uh, and this but one woman, uh, her husband died, uh, Jigana, uh, next, uh, he aborted. Scopes did them, why go them, Gabbard? They go to them, Dark, and why one day did a few laps, a halide. Jebeda Skoro Rattle, Skoro Rattle, she showed that I was persuading that Kobati and some wild. She was sure to go alive, Rattle. That's about how it sounds. And with a lot of little rocks inside, you know. And, and she sings. Uh, and she kept going on like this, and the the new gator for the yard, the the yard, and the the was the 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 now, uh, uh, and 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 
Ау, шамал, дети, агат. Там кислоги нам, там гоем, не стекло, да, колдо, там водогом. Хани, что не ушел, там тогом, хани годом, хоем, хани мунея, людоди, лавапан, там людоштен, да, как шом, да, когда ушел, там генамон, супо, а где мы видим, не ушел, мон. А где не ушел, Хайявут, <laughs> <laughs> Да, <laughs> <laughs> Oh, No, Skonak. Go to the Dachan, go to the Dachan, go And Палах, палах, 
I think they call it blue herring in English. <coughs> and uh, he came walking down, very stride, uh, proud stride. Cornelia will hate no school off. What a lot of them be jumping Oh dear, we got. Yeah, North Goodwinnaya. <laughs> Kikipaigdia, <laughs> No, you don't mean next, yeah. No, oh, yeah. I want. Uh, go on the board. Just a next. Go on the board. Go on the board. Go on the board. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I can go to. Can you go to the school? Horn. To the school. Come on. To the school. Go on. Uh, 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 u
and a dog and a girl, yeah, yeah, and a dog and a girl, a bog, I was here, no, and the hound, need you and them next to go now. Yeah, the connection. You build together the instruction. So I'm going to go to the next one. So I'm going to go to the next one. I'm going to go to the next one. So I'm going to go to the next one. So I'm going to go to the next one. Agri sakaudi na uneum. Oh, dear, she's got a son of God. Well, don't talk on them. The hell uneum, the talog halka, wabba da uneum. She's got a lot of people. 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 How good? Now we talk. Now we got our our colleagues. So how we talk? I'm connected. Scald. Oh my, I'm going to go to the court. Yeah, we'll talk about next Yeah. Dahil kan sumoy na kanimule ya kinaman na kam. Dahil kan noon intulit dila mo at kam siya. So, dahil ba? We held one ya dahil ya kapit. Agi kadal, dah luar tak dia ukuab, dah dah kau risa, nanti kau risa, kau ni next kau nak not, how, asal, dekau tu nanti ni nanti kuflist, ya, nanti kuflist. His grandchildren. Now, how it's going to happen? Oh, yeah. Go and let them all out. So, I'm all hot from the old dogs. Oh, dear. Next, it's going to happen. And but so we, we, uh, scan the needle of the ones. That's some guilt. I don't want them to make a gun. Next door, and the keep that the someone to keep him to the cop. That comes from the Kinetskin. That the Kinetskin, them, you try to check no real come down, no what come there. Oh, dear, no, I could do the Kinetskin. Yeah, I go back to the pike subway. At the Hanover, North Carnival, was I the one the top of the geek. Oh, the one called Gorsen Lawal, so great, yeah. It's all on the knee, go. They're a Christy world. I'm sure it's going to be called the sun. I'm going to call it the geek. เออเยอะกว่าเอาไว้นะแต่จะคุ้มว่าเดียวเอ็กซ์กี้ค่ะคนนี้เอ็กซ์กี้ออกจากเอาเนื้อของเราแต่มันจะได้คนเอ็กซ
Yeah. Uh, I don't know the word for peak in Somalia. But, but that's what they, that guy told him. They, yeah. So he fashioned the skin and tied it up and, and they took it up and it was flying up to the sky and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and she, the mother heard the voices again. Oh, he was worried. His, her people is having a bad time again. <clears throat> so she, without saying anything, she cracked open the skin and peeked out. Bam! She back on the beach again. All of them. And this time, the young man was really angry. Soon the next is going up. Yeah. How? Them get bad, them can make all the, can make all the them bad, the one of that, some skin. It's a, it's a, it's a red skin. It's a noon, them, the real skin, the white skin. And at noon, them, them, them heights could be a textlach, lach, textlach, it's a point. Yeah. I forget point. It's called to actually deplach you, deplach you. Yeah, oh. you, textlach you. Uh, and then we heights can. That no one them from the locks. Now we heard them locks, them marks of the stone. No one them in Sadara, the locks. We can't get them the locks. So he tied them up again and off they went. And again, the mother heard the, the heard the no no no, I don't know why the it's up there. I get I scrubbed them, get on them canets. Okay, the shoes are the most hard. Yeah, no no canets. Right now, uh, yeah, so. So how could you do it for who? No, she was not part of my life. 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 They go, na plach lach. Heis ke dir gwe. Ka ko, ki es jat at skokshen. Es genet. Ja, na sa ga we lach. Sa ga di, a ga di get. Ja, a we lach. Ja. Ja. Sa ga di get vas. Na ga no di get o. O, hi vi haut ka. Ha na. They would keep them locked. Had to get a stamp or work like the mask, the mask of the, uh, uh, the sun, uh, keep them locked. The way or the way out to get. So, and it's not so much that there's nothing new to get or where it goes faster to get go. So, so Dale actually did not show laughter, stammered, which is like a ball to be gone out. Yeah, yeah. I guess the best for them, the snow together was he out the nose going up. I was again at that, I got his knees, and the air stirred. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so I'm just going to go. Yeah, I'm just going to go. Yeah, I'm just going to go. 
Yeah, I can do a lot of shorts that you had some skin, but uh, the English, is, they call coins on a tree. And the birds come and eat the keys out of the coin, and some of the keys, uh, coins would fall on the ground, and all the keys would fall out of the coin when it rolls on the ground. And this is how the the gigamach were spread around uh, the uh, the north going up, and then. <coughs> The bears would come and feed on the seeds of the tree. The double oil, the seeds. I forget the word for seeds. Anyhow, the bears would eat the seeds, and when they get full of the seeds, they walk around the forest and and uh, they 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 poop and they fall to the ground and when the rains come and, and uh, dissolves uh, the excrements and it all goes back into the ground. But in the, in the meantime the seeds that were in that Experiments, they yeah, went into the ground and started uh, sprouting up. And this is how the hemlock tree got spread through the forest. Uh, uh, yeah. So we had the hemlock camp. Yeah. That the young girl that we had the cured. And this was the fight of the first hemlock tree to make a family of hemlocks. It's Savannah Dalgona. And, and uh, Ken will uh, interpret the story for me in English for you. She's a good storyteller. <laughs> Thank you. I, I love this story and I think for years I'm still going to be, I'm going to continue to take lessons from this story. But in this story, white shugi goth means in ancient times, goth means year. And when you say white or why, like you hear a lot of Simshan say why wa, why is like to magnify something um, to incredible amount. So when you put that with years, um, it's years beyond counting. That's how long ago this took place. So white shugi goth. Uh, Long ago, in a village, this was a summer village, the people were at their summer village, and they were um, fishing and smoking fish, drying fish, and uh, collecting all the foods they need for winter. And uh, in this village, the chief um, learned that there was a woman in the village who was practicing halite. She had the ability to make other people sick for a price. And so the chief didn't want this happening amongst his people. So he made a plan that uh, at the end of the summer, when it was time to return to the winter village, that um, he would leave her and her daughter there at the summer village site. Now, he kept his, his plan secret, but this um, Halite, she was very uh, smart, and she, she knew what the chief was planning. So she started hiding food up in the woods and in the, um, like in the uh, uh, roots of trees. And so when the people left to the winter village and they left her and her daughter back on the beach, uh, they were able to use that stored food for a while. But eventually, that food was gone. It was used, used up. And so the Halite, she walked up into the forest, and she shouted um, out to the open air, Who will marry my daughter? Who will marry my daughter? And a black bear stepped forward, and he said, I will marry your daughter. And then the mother said, What can you do? 
And so the bear, he boasted. He said that he's very strong and that he could uh, get her a lot of food to eat and he could protect her. But the mother said, that's not good enough. And so the halite, she walked down to the beach and she shouted to the open air, Who step forward and he walked in a very um, beautiful way with his long legs and he said I will marry your daughter and the mother asked what can you do and boy whoops, I think this one out. Oh, that uh, blue heron was very proud of himself and he said well <laughs> I can find all the little feeder fish She'll have as much as she wants. And I can stand for a long time on one leg. <laughs> the mother said, that's not good enough. <laughs> so she walked back up into the forest and she, she shouted to the open air, who will marry my daughter? And a deer stepped forward and he said, I will marry your daughter. And the mother she asked, what can you do? And uh, he said, well, I know all of the edible roots and the edible leaves and um, the lichen. I, could, I know which lichen is good to eat. Uh, I'll make sure she has all the food she wants. And the mother said, that's not good enough. So she, the mother walked down to the beach again and she shouted out in the open air, who will marry my daughter? Who will marry my daughter? And she felt like someone was standing behind her, so she turned around, and there was a man, a handsome young man, that just appeared, and he said, I will marry your daughter. And the mother asked him, what can you do? And he said, well, I come from very important people. And I'll make sure that she's always respected by everybody. And that I'll make sure that anything she wants, she will have. And your daughter will never go hungry. She'll always be safe. And uh, she'll be highly respected because I come from high-ranking people up in the sky. And so the mother thought that was a good deal for herself. So she said, very well, you may marry her. So this... Uh, this man, who was a supernatural being, married her daughter, and the two had children. And things were very well in this uh, vill summer village site. And uh, as the children uh, were getting older, the husband said to the mother-in-law, I would like to take the, my children up to meet my parents in heaven. I want them to know my children. And so the mother said, I must go with uh, the the son-in-law said, very well, yes, we'll all go together. So he had a, a blanket, uh, like a big cedar bark woven blanket. And he said, this is how we're going to do it. We all need to step on to this, to the shkun, the, the, the woven cedar bark bl blanket. And I'm going to pull up all of the edges and I'll hold up the top. And then we're all... But the son-in-law, he warned the mother-in-law, he said, when we're going up, you're going to hear a lot of strange noises. And it's very important you do not peek out. Do not peek out no matter what you hear. And we're going to get there. And so the mother-in-law promised, very well, do as you say. So they all stepped on, and he picked up the corners of the, of the blanket, and they started rising up, up towards heaven. And uh, the mother heard all the strange sounds. It sounded like children crying and uh, uh, screaming sounds. So her curiosity got the best of her, and she peeked out of the blanket. And as soon as she peeked out, boom, they, they landed back on the beach, all of them. And the son-in-law said, I told you not to peek out. We're going to try this again. But this time, do not peek out. 
And so the mother-in-law promised, okay, I'm not going to peek this time. And so they got back on the blanket. He pulled up the corners, and they all began to rise up into the sky in the blanket. And once again, the mother heard these strange sounds, and she peeked again, and boom, they landed right back on that same beach. Now the son-in-law said, okay, for this last time, we're going to try it one more time, but if you peek out again, I'm going to leave you here, and we'll, the rest of us will go up. And so the mother-in-law promised. She said, okay, I'm not going to peek this time. So they all stepped back on the blanket. He picked up the corners, and he held them up high above their heads, and the whole blanket with the family started rising up. But the mother heard the sounds again, and she peeked out. She thought this would be okay. And boom, this time it was only her. Now, Medig said that this woman was a tall, slender woman, and she ended up at the end of a, a point of land, and her arms were straight out, and she was turned into a hemlock tree. And... Uh, that in winter time, when the wind blows strong through her boughs, you can hear her moaning. Yeah, well, as the wind goes through, whoosh, whoosh. and in a very, very cold winter, you can hear her bones cracking. Um, when the wind blows and it's really cold, you can hear her, her bones snapping. And uh, so this is the story of the very first hemlock tree. And John told you in English how. Um, how many other trees got spread around. But John also tells that when he was young and uh, going hunting with his father, his father told him, when you pull your skiff up, no matter what island you're going to, when you pull up your skiff to the beach, don't go into the woods until you look up top and you look for a hemlock tree. Once you find a hemlock tree, you're going to look at the very tip. Now on the very tip of the hemlock tree, uh, is pointing in the direction that the predominant wind blows it. Now, this is going to tell you in the, that specific area where the predominant wind comes from, and that's like a compass. You need to use this and know this once you go up into the woods. And if you get lost up there, all you have to do is look up to the top of a hemlock tree, and you're going to know how to back to get back where you started from. So uh, that's one of the lessons John uh, teaches about the hemlock tree. And so um, the word for hemlock tree is geek, geek. So it's an easy word to say, but uh, we get all this um, lovely appreciation from John and his insight. So I'm going to um, move aside, and uh, the, the class is going has a skit. They have developed a script based on John's story and they would like to show that to you now. Testing, testing. <coughs> the origin of the hemlock tree. The hemlock tree is like a compass. Look at the top of the tree. You will see that the tip of the tree bends over. Look at which direction the tip is leaning towards. 
The hemlock tree, she stands there and faces the predominant wind. Ours is southeast that way. The hemlock stands there and the wind comes over here and the top of the hemlock bends over. While it's bending over, the sun comes down and dries it out, so it stays that way. Around Ketchikan, the predominant wind comes out of the southeast, so the hemlock points away from southeast. When you go into the woods, first you know where the wind blows. You can use it like a compass if you get lost. The hemlock is like a compass in the forest. This is the story of the hemlock tree. Long ago, there was a tribe who were at fish camp. All the people worked fishing, smoking, and drying the salmon for winter. The chief became aware there was a woman amongst them who was practicing halate. For a price, she could make people sick. The chief did not want her making people sick. Secretly, he made a plan to leave the woman and her daughter at the fish camp when the tribe returned to its winter village. The woman found out the chief's plans and secretly began hiding food in the forest. Eventually, the day came when the people packed up the canoes to leave. The chief announced that nobody should allow the Halit and her daughter to get into the canoes. Away they paddled. So they packed up everything, all all the housewares and put it in the canoes, the big dugouts that they had, and paddled away. The mother and the girl stood on the beach and watched them disappear in the distance. For some time, the woman and her daughter survived off the food she had hidden away. But what little food the mother was able to scrape together was soon depleted, and there was nothing more for them to eat. When they ate all the food, the, men, the woman made a plan. The best thing for her to do, she thought, was to get her daughter a husband. She walked out into the beach and cried loud up into the sky and into the forest, asking, Who my daughter? Who will marry my daughter? Who will marry my daughter? The animals and the birds in the forest heard her cry. A deer came out and told her that he would marry her daughter. I will marry your daughter. What can you do? I know all the safe leaves to eat in the forest. That's not good enough. The mother walked back down to the beach and shouted out, Who will marry my daughter? Will marry my daughter. A heron walked out onto the beach and replied, I will marry your daughter. What can you do? Well, I know all how to find all the small feet of fish, and I can stand on one leg for a long period of time. That's not good enough. <laughs> the mother walked back up into the woods and called out again, asking who would marry her daughter. Who will marry my daughter? A big black bear walked out from the trees and said, I will marry your daughter. I will marry your daughter. <laughs> what can you do? I can catch fish in the stream and I can berries in the woods. That will not do. We're not animals. We're human beings. She walked back down to the beach again. She shouted out, Who will marry my daughter? Who? Who will marry my daughter? <coughs> the people who live up in the sky the spirit people, they heard her cry. A spirit being in the form of a handsome young man asked what she was crying about. What are you crying about? She answered that she and her daughter were starving. My people left me. And my daughter here to starve. I don't want us to die, so I'm asking if anybody wants to marry my daughter, and maybe that will help us live. The young man said he would marry her daughter. I will marry your daughter. Well, what can you do? I can make saves to catch the fish in the streams. 
I know how to preserve fish for the winter. I know how to preserve berries in Bentwood boxes to eat in winter. You'll do. <laughs> <laughs> One day the husband came to his wife and mother-in-law to say his father wanted to see his grandchildren. Grandfather would like to see his grandchildren. He wants us to go up there and take his grandchildren and you and your daughter with us. I'll make a blanket, I'll spread it out on the beach, and you can sit in the middle of it. I'll tie it together and fly us up off into my father's country. There's one thing you mustn't do when you're going up in the sky and when you hear the people cry down on the land, when you hear all the cries of the people, you do not look out to see what's it, what it's all about. Do you understand? I won't do it. So he got all the edges together and the mother and daughter and their family all sat inside the big blanket. He lifted it up and started to fly up to his father's country. During the flight, the mother heard the cries of the people on earth. They were crying like mad. She wondered what was the matter. What is the matter with them? Are they having troubles? I think I'll take a peek. Just a peek. She opened up the side of the blanket and looked out. Just a little peek, you know. All of a sudden, they were right back where they started, on the beach. The young man came to her and said he had warned her. I told you, I told you not to look out, that if you did, we'd be back, right back here where we started. We'll go again and try. If you look out again, only you will be back down here on the beach. The rest of us will go to my father's country. So they tried again. The sun took them up into the sky, and the same thing happened. She heard the cries of the people. Oh, man, she couldn't take it. She couldn't stand to hear her people crying. So she lifted the blanket a crack and looked out. All of a sudden, she was on a point of land, a projection from the mainland. From that point, you could see up and down the coast. She was standing there, but she couldn't move. She couldn't move, and when she looked around, she saw branches. For arms and legs, she had branches of wood. She was a tall, skinny woman, and this tree, she became a hemlock, was tall and skinny with lots of branches. She became a hemlock tree on the point. She could look up and down the coast, in the winter time when the wind blows strong, you can hear her cry. That is how we come to have the hemlock tree.